everybody, and welcome to the All About Film for Kodak Ultramax 400. This video discusses Kodak Ultramax 400 film and looks at how to use it, the film's characteristics, some technical details, and copious sample images. Ultramax 400 is a fast film available in 35mm factory rolled cassettes of 24 and 36 exposures. Let's start this video by looking at the data sheet. Here's a screen grab, and the link to the data sheet is in the video's description. Let's tear apart four parts of this data sheet, these four things we're looking at here, and talk about what's being said. So all four of these are under the Features section. The first one is T-grain emulsion. T-grain is tabular grain, and what it means is that the silver halide grains in the film emulsion are flatter than in traditional, now we can say old-style, film emulsions. T-grain film crystals lie flatter in the emulsion, which improves image resolution and reduces stray light scattering. T-grain crystals have a lot of surface area because they grow on flat planes, meaning more of the crystal surface is available to be exposed to light, and that improves film performance. Many emulsions today are T-grain because of that. The next feature we're going to look at is called antenna dye sensitization. We're going to call it ADS for short. ADS is a sensitization technique that causes the formation of multiple layers of sensitizing dyes on a single silver halide crystal. So basically the dyes connect or bond, that's a better word, bond with the silver halide crystals in layers on top of them. The outer layers of those dyes allow light transmission to the lower layers and the silver halide grain surfaces. ADS is a way to help solve one of the remaining technical issues with silver halide emulsions, specifically the low absorption rate of visible light by silver halide crystals. In short, silver halide crystal exposure is aided by sensitizing dye, and this is true of all films, by the way, that makes the crystals more reactive to specific wavelengths. ADS makes the crystals sensitive to even more wavelengths. The next feature are the Advanced Development Accelerators. Accelerators are chemicals in the film emulsion that increase the activity of the developing chemistry. Insofar as I can tell, these would be used to help increase the exposure for the specific developing process used in C41 film. If you didn't know this, C41 film is all processed the exact same way for the exact same amount of time, whether it's 100 or 800 ISO. The final feature to talk about here is the optimized color precision technology. This sounds like a marketing person got their hands on the data sheet for a few minutes. In a nutshell, my best guess here about what this means is that it is some kind of technology in the film, likely having to do with specific sensitizing dyes, that improves color trueness. For my recommended rating for this film, it's going to be 400. I did push Ultramax to 1600 one time, I did that on accident, but I pushed it. And honestly, at 1600, Ultramax retained no shadow detail. In general, Ultramax 400 seems to be well suited for 400 ISO use, and it's very tolerant at that rating to overexposure. We'll talk about that a little bit more later in this video. My best tip for getting the most out of this film, now in general, consumer-grade films deliver a bit less than higher-end films. Does this mean they aren't good or usable? No. And you can get great images from this film that are as good as your creative vision supports. I found two routes that worked really well for achieving that. First, I liked this film when I used it in my best cameras with my best lenses. That really did deliver as much detail as I think this film can yield. I was able to get suitable resolution, but not eyelash detail, for instance. Another route is to accept that this is not Portra or Ektar, and use it in lower spec gear like the Kodak branded Corex cameras such as the i60 and F9 Ultra, or in other reusable cameras, and with budget lenses on your SLRs, budget lenses being things like vintage uh, Sigma lenses from the 60s and 70s which don't hold up to today's standards, if we're honest. Ultramax 400 also worked well with most, if not all, of the subjects I put in front of it. It's a good generalist film. 
It recorded skin tones decently well and has pretty good color accuracy, even though the tones, especially on the warm side, were highly muted. Ultramax is not the film you want to grab when you're looking for colors that pop off the image or you're excited to go photograph peak aspen foliage in autumn. Grain is high, with it being noticeable in small prints as well as digitizations. The Kodak print grain index for this film is 46, nearly as high as the PGI for Portra 800. This is, of the Kodak films I could find data for, the second grainiest Kodak print film Kodak makes. Color trueness is generally okay in the cool tones and lighter skin tones. As the spectral sensitivity curve in the next section shows, using a mid-scale neutral subject, this film has relatively low warm tone sensitivity, especially in the orange and yellow-orange range. And the autumn color photos in this video ought to illustrate that. The data sheet provides no detail on acuteness. Gauging this by eye, Ultramax 400 appears to have a softer acuteness than other C41 film stocks. In its class, consumer films that is, it performs better than comparable films. Compared to high-end films, which is of course an unfair comparison, Ultramax 400 is soft. Contrast is highly variable by lighting with harsh contrast in full sun and more reasonable contrast in overcast and foggy settings. The data sheet indicates this is a sharp film, but provides no metrics or MTF chart. I generally concur, though note that you need a very good lens to get the most sharpness out of this film stock. Digital conversion is a mixed bag. Digitizing this film enlarges it, unless the images are viewed on a phone, to ratios greater than the 4.4x that gives this film a PGI of 46. So, looking at these images on your monitor will exacerbate the grain. This is not a film meant for large prints, nor to be enlarged onto a 32-inch monitor. So this will vary by your target audience, the digital conversion that is. If you are making images for smartphone display, this film will have little noticeable grain. If you are making images for computer monitor display, then your images are going to look kind of like mosaics. One additional note, color saturation on Ultramax continually surprised me. Going into my time with this film, I considered it a generally flat film with lackluster colors, excessive grain, and poor shadow and highlight detail. My time using it didn't completely sway my perceptions, but the film consistently delivered good saturation in the blue and green tones. The spectral sensitivity curve is used to describe the film's relative sensitivity, that's the y-axis, to the visible light wavelengths, which is the x-axis. This is the spectral dye density curve graph from the 2016 Ultramax datasheet. For this section, focus on the dashed line as that's the relative dye density, the relative image color density when you receive your images, for the different color spectra. In general, I found that Ultramax delivered fairly unexciting warm tones with relatively little tonal distinction. This is supported by the orange wavelength dip. In fact, the photos I took of Steinbeck with this film are among the least lifelike I've taken with his coat having a flat brown appearance. In real life, Steinbeck has myriad brown tones in his fur, and now some gray tones, but in general, he ranges from having flecks of khaki to mahogany-stained cherry wood over a base coat of hot chocolate spilled on brand new white sheets. The data sheet provides no specific guidance for reciprocity failure, in keeping with Kodak standard practice for consumer-grade films. Kodak notes that no adjustment is needed from one ten thousandth to a full second, so everyone but Alpha 9 users can rejoice. For exposures beyond a second, some compensation and filtration may be needed. I wish I could provide some guidance on what this would be, but this was a fast enough film that I never took it beyond a full second, and, honestly, when it comes to ultra-long exposures for things like star trails, those are enough of a time investment that I'm not grabbing a consumer film for those. If the shot turns out, I want it to be its best. 
Were I to try long exposures with Ultramax, I'd probably try to double the needed exposure for anything beyond a second as a baseline. I'd use a 24 exposure roll to take a series of ever longer images at night and see where the exposures began to look thin on the negative. At that point, you'll know that tripling or quadrupling image exposure time is in order. Then looking at the color shift, you can select an appropriate opposite tone filter for use. This whole process, by the way, is going to require some good note taking. Kodak's datasheet doesn't provide specific latitude guidance. Every review I found online had positive things to say about the film's latitude. I'm going to give you a more nuanced take. Ultramax 400 handles overexposures well, underexposures poorly. One of the reasons this film works well in cameras like the Corex reusable models is that those use a shutter speed of around 1 100th of a, of a second and an aperture of about f9. That means that in full sun, a 100 ISO film can be used with acceptable results. Using Ultramax in that setting is giving the film a lot more light than it needs, but it handled those cameras very well for me. When I had shots where Ultramax was underexposed, the shadows were non-existent and full of digital scanning noise. So, feel free to throw way too much light at Ultramax 400 and avoid throwing too little. Ultramax is one of those films that I started using only for this series. Honestly, were I not making this series, I would never pick it up. I find the image results fairly unexciting. To make this video, I shot more than 20 rolls in 12 different cameras. To give Ultramax 400 the fairest chance to really shine that I could, I used a lot of high-end gear. My Minolta Alpha 9, Pentax LX, Canon F1, Nikon F2 and F5, Konica Autorex P, and Kyocera T-proof round out the cameras that I would consider good that I used. With the SLRs, I used a lot of high-quality OEM lenses, like vintage Nikkors, some excellent Canon FDN lenses like the 135mm f2, and the Pentax Limited series. I also shot in a double film show, an old Bell & Howell plastic camera, and a Robot 3 action camera. If I'm honest, using it across a number of classes and tiers of gear quality, I came out of the three years that I used this stock off and on, recognizing it has usability, but not liking it more than I did. So I did try to be as even-handed as I could with this review, given that I'm not going to miss using Ultramax. Ultramax is a fine film for some settings, casual photography, as a low-cost C41, or as a decently good, for the money, fast film. Ultramax can absolutely create captivating and good images if you have a good creative vision. So Ultramax does have a market, and if you're learning film, it's a good and relatively forgiving color film to learn with. Ultramax is not likely to be the film you feel drawn to using your whole career as a film photographer. Also, it shouldn't be. There are many films out there with more interesting performance characteristics. Ultramax seeks to be a forgiving film that makes your first mistakes less significant. This allows you to learn the basics without your learning curve ruining shots. So use Ultramax that way and have it help you springboard into better films that require you have a better understanding of film photography before you use them. That is the highest and best use for Kodak Ultramax.